So, welcome back again. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, Scott. He's British. And he's incredibly good. And he's going to talk about something that I think is incredibly important. But, if you go online and check the majority of websites in the world, they are not doing as Scott says they should be doing. And that's a shame. And I will leave it to Scott to explain the rest. Take the away, Scott. Thank you. So, my name is Scott Helm. Um, I'm an information security consultant. I work at a company called Pentest Limited. We're headquartered in the north of England. Um, I have a huge personal focus on web security. And the three technologies that I will be talking about today are HTTP response headers known as HSTS, HPKP, and CSP. And these are all security headers. Uh, I call them security headers that we can issue from our site to the clients that visit us in order to configure or control security features within the browser of visitors to our site. Now, uh, these headers are all aimed at getting information from the browser to us, the host, in a more secure fashion. So targeting the security of that browsing session. And typically, a lot of our efforts are focused on the actual server itself. So we could have user access management, privilege management, we may ensure that our applications are protected against things like SQL injection to stop people accessing the data on our servers. Thank you. And, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's usually targeted around the server. Um, you know, we want to stop people being able to access the data that resides on our servers, and that's where a lot of the focus originally for security was. Over the last decade or so, and certainly within the last few years, that focus and our responsibility has extended out into the transport layer with a, a huge drive towards HTTPS to ensure that the, the user's credentials, the most important thing that we want to protect in most sessions, actually arrive to us as the host without having been intercepted by a third party. And the three headers that we're looking at today actually extend our control out into the browser. So we um, can not only enforce security policies in the browser, but we can actually start to control features and functions of the browser, and in some instances, even override um, user behavior that we would deem to be insecure. So the first header that I want to look at is HSTS, or HTTP Strict Transport Security, by its full name. Now, in a typical browsing session, um, we're going to look at the, the actual problem that HSTS solves first. So a user wants to visit Twitter. They'll typically open their browser and type in twitter.com, which is the blue part here. The browser, because HTTP is still the default protocol on the web, will actually prepend that with HTTP. So the user will actually send their first request over an insecure protocol. Now, because Twitter enforced security on their site, they respond back with a 301 redirect that says, come back to us over HTTPS for the same request. The browser honors that redirect and then issues the request over HTTPS. Now, the problem with this is that the first part of our interactions with the host actually took place over HTTP, which is plain text protocol. It's not secure. Um, and that leaves it open to be intercepted, to be modified, and to be tampered with. So what we end up with in scenarios like that is potentially what we know as SSL stripping attacks, where an attacker can actually insert themselves in between us and the secure host that we were supposed to be talking to. Um, because the redirect comes back over HTTP, the attacker simply throws that away, doesn't pass it back to the user, and they will talk to the host, in this case Twitter, via HTTPS, and they will continue to talk to the victim over HTTP. Now, the victim's browser has no idea that this has happened, the communications have been tampered with, and they were never redirected. So everybody continues happy. Twitter's got a HTTPS connection, and the browser is continuing to speak HTTP to the attacker. And this is what HSTS um, is intended to fix. One of the problems that we can resolve with a single line of configuration to issue one response header back to the browser. So we issue the strict transport security header, and there's only actually one directive that is required for a valid policy, and it is the max age directive. This is the number of seconds that the browser is to treat the host as a HSTS host. That is, how long are we supposed to only talk to this site over HTTPS? Uh, you can optionally add the include subdomains directive. That's fairly obvious, and I'll cover the preload directive uh, in just a few slides. So we issue this HSTS policy to a browser, and what this actually results in, compared to the initial connection where we type in twitter.com and the browser defaults to HTTP, 
is that the browser never actually sends the request. The, the request doesn't actually leave the browser. Instead of a 301 direct, redirect, sorry, which comes from the host, the browser does an internal redirect. So the request never actually leaves the browser. It is a 307 internal redirect. And the request then actually goes out over the wire on HTTPS. So we never spoke HTTP to anything on the internet. So what we can then actually do is move to enforced HTTPS communications and actually override any actions that the user may take to try and use HTTP. Even if the user types in HTTP or has a bookmark that is HTTP, clicks on a link that is HTTP, the browser will override that and it will enforce HTTPS communications with that particular host. I mentioned the preload directive. Um, one of the problems with HSTS is that our first connection to the site, we don't actually know that they are a HSTS host. We've actually got to make the connection to get that policy back to remember them as a HSTS host. And preloading resolves that. Uh, there's a site run by Google and you can actually submit your site to be in what they call the preload list. And this is a list of sites that is actually built into the browser. So you're, you can have your domain name actually baked into the browser so it will never speak HTTP or any insecure protocol to your site. If you include yourself in the Chromium list, all of the other major browser vendors have now adopted this and you can go to the list, search for sites that are in there. So any of these browsers will never speak HTTP to any domain in the preload list, which includes twitter.com. So you can never actually, even if the user types HTTP, the main thing here is that we can override the insecure behavior. We can enforce the security of the browsing session. The second header, HBKP, slightly more complicated, or HTTP public keypinning by its full name. Um, if we want to use HTTPS on our sites, we have to go to a certificate authority and we have to get a certificate for that. So we generate a key pair on our servers. From that, we generate a certificate signing request, which we take to the authority and say, please, can you give us our certificate? We do some configuration with that certificate on our servers. And if we get that right, when people visit our site, we should get green padlocks and nice indicators in the browser. One of the good things about the current public key infrastructure is there are a great deal of certificate authorities that you can go to to get your certificate, which introduces uh, some nice... <laughs> which introduces uh, you know, some nice competition. You may choose to use a provider that you already use for other services. Um, there may be geographical constraints, but there is a, a large number of authorities out there that can issue certificates. But one of the problems is that any authority can issue a certificate for any domain. There's no limitations on, you know, say, Australian authorities only issuing to Australian sites. If you are a certificate authority, you can issue a certificate for any domain. And this introduces the problem that if a certificate is issued for your domain that you don't know about, and we've seen some fairly prevalent examples of this, Diginotar was a Dutch certificate authority, I believe. They were compromised in the early 2000s. They issued a certificate for gmail.com that the Iranian government used to intercept traffic at their borders. And then from that, they can lift user credentials and everything is game over. Startcom, another certificate authority, was compromised by a security researcher who issued themselves a certificate for paypal.com. And with these certificates, you can impersonate these sites and get all of the green markers in the browser. There is no difference. Um, the attacker will generate a key pair. They generate a certificate signing request. They send it to the certificate authority who gives them their certificate. They do some configuration on their server. And if they get that right, they get green HTTPS, except they are now me. And HPKP is what allows us to solve this problem, to stop other people being able to use rogue or misissued certificates to impersonate us and our sites. A valid HBKP policy is a little bit bigger than the HSTS policy, but we issue the public keepings header. It's got the familiar max age directive, which is the number of seconds that the browser should cache and store and apply this policy for. And then we have the pin SHA-256 attribute. And this is just the hash of our public key or the SPKI of our public key. So we're saying these are our keys and these are the keys that you should expect us to use going forwards. So in the scenario where an attacker tries to generate or, or obtain a rogue certificate from an authority, they have to generate their own keys to have signed by the certificate authority. And in that situation, the browser can look at that certificate and even if the certificate is valid, it will be for the correct host name. 
it will be within its validity period and it is issued by a trusted authority. And those are the only metrics without HPKP that the browser has to make the decision on whether or not it should trust this certificate. HPKP introduces an additional metric that the browser can check and it's whether or not this particular site has said it will use this public key. The include subdomains directive, again, similar to the HSTS policy, is whether or not to apply this to subdomains on the site or whether it's just for the particular domain that issued it. And the report URI directive is in there. I'm actually gonna cover that when I talk about one of the other headers. So I'm gonna skip over that for now and come back to it in a little bit more detail in the CSP section. Now, there's a few people with laptops and devices and I actually want to quickly demonstrate what a HPKP violation should look like. So if you have a browser on any device now, if you open it and go to my address, terrible pun, uh, terrible plug, sorry, uh, go to scotthelm.co.uk, I issue on that domain a HPKP policy. So when you first visit that page, you go to scotthelm.co.uk, your browser will receive and cache that policy. I then have, after you visited that page, a subdomain on my site that is HPKP scotthelm.co.uk. So once you've received and cached my policy, if you visit that subdomain, you will know whether or not you have a HPKP compliant browser, because what you should get is this. If your browser actually allows you to visit this site, I've set up the demonstration here with a, a rogue certificate. This is a certificate not included in my policy. So as far as your browser is aware, this should be flagged as a rogue certificate and you should not be allowed to visit this subdomain. If your device allows you to visit this, the particular browser that you're using is not HPKP compliant. And the next header that I want to talk about um, is the favorite, my favorite of the three headers is CSP or Content Security Policy. Now, CSP um, is often described as just a whitelisting mechanism for sources of content on your pages. This doesn't do CSP the full justice of what it is possible to do with it. And I'm actually only going to cover a subset of the directives that you can issue with a CSP policy. Uh, this is approximately half of the directives that you can issue in a CSP. And each of these directives allows you to define a whitelist of the host that you can load these particular types of content from. So what that basically translates into is you can control the values that are allowed inside certain sources of content on your pages. So for example, with the connect source, you can control where your site is allowed to do things like Ajax from. With the image source directive, you can specify the allowed sources in image tags on your pages. And this is, this is quite interesting. And the useful, like the, the real useful ones here are things like form action. Where do you want your site to be allowed to post those user credentials from? If something happens in the browser, maybe a malicious browser extension will change the form actions. So it's going to post users' credentials elsewhere, and then they can still be redirected and logged in, but somebody could harvest the credentials along the way. Um, things like iframe source. You know, what if somebody embeds a malicious iframe in our site that looks like a login page, but isn't actually our login page? We can prevent that from happening by restricting the locations that you can actually load iframes from. And another really crucial one of content security policy is the script source. <clears throat> content security policy by default blocks inline script. So you can't have script tags in your DOM that just have the raw JavaScript inside them because we have no way of being sure of the source of that, so it's blocked by default. What you then have to do is externalize your JavaScript and just reference it from your own domain as a JavaScript file. Uh, what this means is you can also limit third-party domains that your scripts are loaded from. And this is an incredibly effective defense against cross-site scripting attacks. We aren't allowed to execute inline and we can control the sources of third-party script in our pages. I saw an example recently of a site. Um, this is a slightly cut down version of the code, but they had a review section at the bottom of their page where they could cycle through all of their wonderful five-star reviews that they had. And at the top of the page was the login button that would slide down the login form and the user would type in their credentials on this page. Somebody who had left a review on the site had included a script tag. I've slightly changed the domain, hopefully evil.com was a bit too obvious. And ultimately the file was just a JavaScript keylogger. And they'd actually managed to load this into any page where these reviews were displayed. So every time a user went to the site, they clicked the login dropdown, and every time they pressed the key, the JavaScript file would be sending each keystroke away 
and effectively the attacker was just logging usernames and passwords for anybody that logged into the site. And this is one of the things that we could prevent quite easily with content security policy. If the attacker had inserted inline script, it would be blocked by default. It wouldn't be executed. And hopefully evil.com wouldn't have been in your whitelist of sources that you can load JavaScript from. So a, a simple CSP policy, um, a valid CSP policy, I've created a little example here. Uh, they can be as, as restrictive or as relaxed as you like. Um, you know, you can start with a very basic CSP and start to increase its effectiveness. So here I've gone for default source and used the wildcard. I typically advise people to use wildcards as their default in CSP because each directive that you specify overrides the default. A lot of the, a lot of the directives fall back to it. But if you specify the directive, it overrides it. It doesn't inherit from it. And this is kind of a safety mechanism because a couple of browsers aren't quite fully CSP compliant and do some strange things. So it's, I suppose it's your typical fail open or fail close scenario. And with CSP at the minute, it's better to fail open. Um, so I've defined here a script source. I've used the CSP keyword self, which is basically just the domain that served the policy. So we say, we're happy loading scripts from our own domain. And I've included the CDN that I use for all of my scripts. And you can go on through the rest of the directives. Form action, self. We only ever want to post any form data back to me. We don't want the ability for anybody to change that to be an external source. Uh, same again for frame ancestors. These are the people that can frame us to protect our users against click tracking attacks, things like that. We don't want anybody to be able to frame our pages. And the same again for child source. That's what we use to define who can create iframes within our page. And we don't want to iframe anybody in this particular example. And I want to move on to the report URI directive. This is an optional directive. Um, you don't have to specify this. But CSP has the ability to send reports when there is a violation of your policy. So if somebody's got the malicious um, keylogger script that we saw a moment ago into our page. They try and load the page and the browser will refuse to load the script because it's from evil.com and evil.com is not in our script source. So the script will not be loaded. The user has been protected. They've not lost their credentials, which is good, but only CSP compliant browsers will actually enforce this. If the browser doesn't understand what the content security policy header is, it will just disregard the header. It won't take any action. With the reporting directive enabled, CSP compliant browsers will actually send us a report to say something happened. And those reports contain some fairly crucial data. So we can see in the JSON object that gets sent back, we can see the document URI, the page that this violation actually occurred on, actually took place on. So I can see here there's a problem on my site on the login page. It tells us the violated directive was a script source. So I know there's some non-whitelisted script somewhere actually in one of my pages. And it tells us the blocked URI as well. If the violation was inline, it will just say inline to say somebody's injected a script tag in. If somebody's trying to load third party content, it will actually tell us where. So we now have information on this CSP violation. So instead of just deploying this policy and allowing it to do its blocking actions, which is good, and we are protecting people, we also actually need to go back and fix this problem. You know, because we still have third party script embedded in our pages, which means somebody's got content in there and we need, to, you know, we need to go and take a further look at that. So CSP reporting is, is really important if you're deploying a uh, content security policy. And it also applies, I mentioned, to HBKP as well. If a user is served a rogue certificate for your site, you can also include the report URI directive. And the browser will send you a report to say, you know, somebody out there has a valid certificate for your domain. And then you can start to take action about that. Now, I want to go over and give a quick summary of, of the areas of each header, really. And so we've got HSTS. HSTS allows us to enforce the use of each of these, um, of HTTPS across any site that issues it. So you can say to a browser, under no circumstances, talk HTTP. You can override user actions if they specifically try to visit your site over an insecure connection, either themselves intentionally or perhaps uh, someone else maliciously. We can override that and tell the browser to drop that connection. One of the other things with HSTS as well is that you can't click through browser warnings. People get warnings in their browsers, pop-up messages. Um, we saw the HPKP example earlier. Most users, when they see things like that, typically from my experience, will just click on the button at the bottom to expand the menu out and click continue anyway. HSTS disables that option. 
you cannot click through any security-based warning for HTTPS in the browser if you issue a HSTS policy. It prevents us against the SSL stripping attacks that I mentioned. You know, we can, we can be sure that if somebody is browsing our site, there is no middleman. There is no one sat on that connection. And of course, sites should preload. If you are redirecting your traffic to HTTPS with a 301 redirect, and then you take the next step to issue a HSTS policy, you should really be preloading that as well. It's easy to submit to the preload list. You include the preload token and just submit your domain into the website that I linked. It will then be built into the Chromium source and picked up by every other major browser vendor out there. HBKP. Um, Google actually recommends that HBKP is only adopted by uh, more mature organizations. There is a slight risk in HBKP in that if you are pinning a particular set of public keys and you say, I'm only going to use this key, and the second key you pin is your backup, so you can shift to the backup, either at certificate renewal or in the event of a compromise. If you lose those key pairs, or those key pairs become compromised, you have no backup to roll to, and the browser does not know that the new certificate that you're using, as legitimate as it is, was not in the policy. So there is some organizational maturity required to issue and deploy a HPKP policy, but to get around that, and you can see the example because GitHub do this. You don't actually have to pin your own public keys. You can pin the public keys of a certificate authority. So instead of the 100 or 200 or so certificate authorities out there that can <clears throat> issue certificates for your domain, GitHub actually pin Digicert and Verisign. So if you're concerned about uh, certificate authorities of other nations that may be under the control of their governments or influenced by foreign governments, you can actually restrict it to just the certificate authorities of your choosing that can issue certificates for your domain. Uh, and this HBKP completely mitigates the, the issuance and the use of uh, rogue certificates. So if somebody does obtain a certificate for your domain, going back to the DigiNotar example, everybody's browsers would have rejected the Gmail certificate and all of the several hundred thousand Iranian users that were compromised would have been protected with the use of HBKP. And then CSP, as I say, this CSP is, is defined as and explained as a content whitelisting mechanism. But there are a considerable number of directives, more than what I showed, and there's a lot more features of CSP than I would even have time to cover in a presentation like this. CSP is an incredibly powerful mechanism. It can be as restrictive or as lax as you like. You can deploy it in report-only mode, so it doesn't actually enforce anything, and you can just use it to monitor your sites in production. Um, it's a, a complete defense against cross-site scripting deployed properly um, as a defense in depth measure with other things like output encoding. You can almost completely neutralize the possibility of cross-site scripting. Um, and reporting is essential. You know, if you're going to deploy HPKP and CSP, you should be reporting. These headers both have a report-only mode that you can set. So you can deploy them into production and say, send me the reports where things would have gone wrong. Don't enforce it, don't actually take action. Just monitor it and tell me where things would have gone bad. So you can deploy these policies and kind of iron out the kinks in report-only mode before you actually enforce them and risk tanking your site <laughs> by getting things wrong. So I've zipped through that a little bit quicker than I was hoping for, um, and I was wondering if there are any questions. <laughs> 